Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for what's going to be the first and hopefully the start of a very exciting AppSAD Insight webinar for this year. I've got to say it's pretty exciting to be back, not only uh, presenting the webinars again, but also stood in front of an audience of people. I know, uh, Stephen, you don't have that luxury at your end, but trust me, it's uh, very nice to look out and see faces looking back at me. And let's hope this is the start of how the year is going to grow and that face-to-face -face can become much more more easier. I think we're going to have a good webinar today. I think it's certainly a timely one. Before I kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm presenting, the Yuggera and Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us out there in webinar land, or indeed in the room in front of me today. So thank you and welcome to today. I'd also acknowledge that Monday this week was uh, International Women's Day. And I think those two groups are um, relevant for today because the, the topic is going to in some way cover trauma, I'm sure. I haven't actually heard the presentation, but the focus of MDMA therapy certainly seems to res revolve around trauma. And I think any tool that we have that can assist our uh, communities with that is definitely a good thing. I should have said my name's Jim, I'm a nurse educator at Insight, and today we've got Dr. Stephen Bright, who's a clinically trained psychologist, um, who's over in WA, so firstly a big thank you for getting up at a really early time of the day in order to join us, I think it was something like 7.30am that he logged on. He's also, Dr. Stephen Bright is also the co-founder of PRISM, which is the psychedelic research in science and medicine. So I think he's going to be an excellent person to cover the topic of what is a growing interest um, in the world of mental health and AOD. And that's the topic of psychedelics, which have traditionally been uh, illegal substances, actually showing some benefit and promise, as I said, for people that may be struggling. So without any further ado, Stephen, I'd like to hand over to you to take over. So thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so look, today's session I think is quite timely given uh, many of you will be aware that the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, recently announced their interim decision not to reschedule MDMA following an application that was made last year to move MDMA from an S9 to an S8. And uh, the final decision will be announced soon. I don't expect that that decision will change. So in many respects, the objective of this webinar is to examine the evidence underpinning the application that was made to the TGA and consider MDMA's future as a medicine, both here and also overseas. So in doing so, I'm gonna cover off on the chemistry and history of MDMA. So while most people will be familiar with MDMA as a recreational drug, prior to this uh, recreational interest in MDMA or ecstasy as it was dubbed, MDMA was being used as an adjunct to psychotherapy. I'll talk a little bit about the psychopharmacology of it and, and why it might be popular as a recreational drug and also how that psychopharmacology might be leveraged to um, utilize it for therapeutic purposes. I'll go into a bit of detail about what MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD actually looks like and present some data from the MDMA clinical trials that have occurred overseas to date. Finally, touch on what's happening in Australia when it comes to MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy research. And the big question really is, when will MDMA be available as a Schedule 8 drug in Australia? And so I provided a link here to a conversation piece that Dr. Martin Williams and I published in the days prior to the TGA's announcement, because we were pretty sure that Australia was not going to be the first country in the world to officially recognise MDMA as a medicine. I like to think we're a progressive country, but I just didn't think this was going to happen. I personally believe the application was made prematurely. And when we look at the TGA's recent decision, I'll be drawing uh, quite heavily on this conversation piece that you guys can access. So MDMA itself was synthesized in 1914 and painted by Merck 
uh, as a potential appetite suppressant. They cease their clinical research in sort of drug development of MDMA as an appetite suppressant because it had these adverse side effects. And these adverse side effects are probably some of the things people who use uh, ecstasy recreationally are actually looking for and are also the same effects that are useful in terms of MDMA and utilizing it as a tool in an, as an adjunct to psychotherapy. Though, of course, because it was synthesized so long ago, it's now off patent. So that creates problems in terms of drug development and developing research programs that are able to, de to provide the evidence of efficacy that's required to get these sorts of things past the FDA, the TGA, the EMA, um, the regular, regulatory bodies. It's not like uh, a pharmaceutical company that has you know, lots of money they put into research and development, then they have the patent for the drug, try to make the money back. Um, and then of course it goes into generic, um, generic availability. So in terms of the chemistry of MDMA, um, it's a substituted phenylethylamine or um, uh, phenethylamine for short. Now, I'm not here to give anybody a chemistry lesson. All you need to know to understand this part of it is a bit of a pattern recognition. So a phenethylamine has a benzene ring. The lines here represent oxygen, carbon, and um, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon atoms. And there's an amino group at the end at the little tail of the spermy looking structure. And we talk about phenethylamines based on where other atoms are placed on the phenethylamine. So there are the alpha, and beta positions. And then there, then there are positions two through to six. So if we were to add a methyl group to the alpha position, we would get alpha methyl phenethylamine, which if you shorten it is amphetamine. Uh, if we add another methyl group to the M position, you get N methyl amphetamine. Um, and by adding that additional methyl group to the end position, obviously increases the potency, but also um, the time the, the drug stays in the body. So MDMA is a substituted phenethylamine. So it looks a little bit like uh, methamphetamine in the tail structure. So it's 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. Um, but clearly MDMA is very different in its effect, its objective effect to methamphetamine. Um, other substituted phenethylamines are 3, 4, 5 trimethoxy uh, phenethylamine or mescaline, the psychedelic drug, and also 2CB. And so in understanding how substituted phenethylamines work on the brain, it would be remiss of me not to mention Dr. Alexander Shulgin, the infamous, infamous psychopharmacologist um, who wrote a book called Phenethylamines I've Known and Loved. It was published in the late 90s. And the rationale was um, Shogun was concerned that his work, which was groundbreaking, um, was going to be, uh, you know, shelved by the DEA um, and it would never get out to the public. And so his way of getting it out to the public was to publish this book. His work essentially involved tweaking the molecular structure of mescaline, creating hundreds of new uh, substituted phenethylamines, uh, including 2CB. And he sort of wrote up this in uh, PECL, which describes the synthesis pathways and also the subjective effects. And he made a number of contributions to understanding the psychopharmacology of the 5-HT2A receptor site through this work. And also made observations like if you put atoms at the, the tail end of the uh, amphetamine, uh, the, of the phenethylamine, you get stimulants. If you play with the uh, benzyl structure, you tend to get um, psychedelic type drugs. And then you get these strange drugs in the middle like MDMA, which are neither psychedelic nor um, stimulants. They don't fit neatly into either of those categories. And Shogun was quite integral in um, helping psychotherapists in the 1970s uh, get access to MDMA. And his wife, Anna Shulgin, worked with uh, patients using MDMA. And then when MDMA was banned, used 2CB as an alternative adjunct to psychotherapy. Uh, when the DEA found out about Shulgin's work, um, they were not happy. They came in, they stripped him of his license, uh, basically trashed his lab, 
took all of the drugs and his response to that, uh, being the fellow he is, was to publish another book, Trip to Means I've Known and Loved, um, sort of same story, new drugs. So as I was saying, in the 1970s, a number of psychiatrists, psychotherapists, psychologists were using MDMA as an adjunct to psychotherapy in the US and in Europe. Um, I'm not sure of evidence of use of it here in Australia. I'm sh there, there, there may well have been. Um, like psychedelics, it's, it's hard to pin down uh, the, the, the data from Australia and um, the archival records, but certainly with psychedelics, there's evidence that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy was happening here. It's important to note that in the 1970s, while MDMA was not banned, it was also not regulated. So this meant that MDMA was being manufactured in large, essentially clandestine laboratories and distributed to um, psychotherapists who were using the drug as a treatment. It essentially, at some stage, someone clued in possibly a, a, a patient that this might have uh, benefits outside of the therapeutic environment, outside of the clinic room. And so in the early 80s, it gained popularity as a recreational drug. It was originally sold at Texan nightclubs as, as Adam, um, not a great brand. And so in turn, um, somebody rebranded it as Ecstasy and, and that's how we get the brand Ecstasy today. Um, in 1984, given Increasing recreational use, the United States Drug Enforcement Agency sought to ban MDMA in 1984. Um, they, in doing so, they wanted to place it in Schedule 1, which is similar to Schedule 9, meaning it has no approved medical use and is unsafe even under medical supervision with significant abuse potential. However, for them to move forward with this, they first had to engage in due process. Part of that due process was um, hiring a, uh, a, a magistrate, ju uh, Judge Francis Young, who was contracted by the D DEA to conduct hearings to determine the most appropriate scheduling of MDMA. The case commenced in March 1985 and lasted about 12 months with many psychiatrists and psychologists providing testimony to the judge. Judge Young ruled that MDMA should be classed as a Schedule Three medicine, which is similar to, uh, it, it's kind of in between our Schedule Four and Schedule Eight. So in the US, uh, ketamine is a Schedule Three medicine, whereas morphine is a Schedule Two. However, the DEA didn't take this advice. They made the drug illegal, placing it in Schedule One, the equivalent of Schedule Nine in Australia. And in 1987, Australia followed the US lead and it was prohibited here too. Um, which is not an uncommon history when we look at the history of prohibition of drugs in Australia. So from 1986 onwards, the National Institute on Drug Abuse spent lots of money trying to demonstrate that they had made the right decision, that this was a drug of abuse, that it was dangerous, that it had um, potential uh, uh, misuse or, or potential, um, you know, problems with, with, with dependence to, to, to essentially justify the decision that had been made. So a lot of money went into uh, MDMA research. So what did they get for that money? Because one of my students, when I presented this presentation, uh, replied saying not much when we got to the end of it. And that was a bit of a waste of money. That's not necessarily my interpretation. So just as one example, um, there was a paper published in 2002 showing that MDMA causes brain damage in monkeys. So you think the, uh, the NIDA would have been happy with that. This is a neurotoxic drug. We, 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 we made the right decision. Unfortunately, the lab got it wrong and they gave the monkeys methamphetamine, not MDMA. And while the paper was retracted, the neuroimaging research that was used was continued, continued to be used in demand reduction campaigns in the US trying to dissuade young people from using ecstasy, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, one of the problems with a lot of the research that's being conducted on MDMA using animal models is they use unrealistically high doses. And the Global Drug Survey 
um, you know, has done has published some papers around the equivalency type dosages of what people are using. And so you can't extrapolate uh, the, the animal models oftentimes to humans. One of the biggest problems with doing research is the problem between observational versus clinical. So most, almost all, all human uh, research done by NIDA was uh, observational studies in which it's difficult to determine what the person has taken. Because as we all know, um, working in the AOD field, ecstasy doesn't necessarily contain MDMA. Uh, it could contain a range of other compounds and there are, may, may be other confounding factors such as uh, behaviours, people engage in polysubstance use, lots of problems with these observational trials in trying to demonstrate the harms associated with MDMA. There is this really interesting study though from Helpern at Harvard where he um, had a control group of, uh, he went into a Amish uh, it was, he did the study in Utah where there was a high Amish population. Uh, the control group were people that had not used MDMA. Um, all of the participants were screened. People that had engaged in any polydrug use were excluded, both past and present, because one of the advantages of um, the population he was looking at, sorry, it wasn't Amish, it was Mormon, um, is that they don't drink alcohol. And he essentially found that there were no significant differences in cognitive functioning between the control group and the, um, the MDMA using group on a range of different psychometric measures, which indicated that it perhaps was an MDMA, but it was polydrug use or staying up late all night or other factors that were causing um, some of the findings that were being seen and um, you know, being published early on. So in terms of um, the psychopharmacology, it is a, a reuptake inhibitor, but it also releases significant amounts of serotonin as well. So in a, it's a bit like an SSRI working as a reuptake inhibitor, but in addition to that, um, it, it works, much, obviously the effects come on much quicker because of the, the release of serotonin in the same way that methamphetamine and amphetamine um, interrupt the dopamine active transporter, meaning that it sort of uh, pushes out dopamine into the brain. MDMA works in a similar fashion, leading to increased levels of serotonin. And this may explain um, some of the physiological symptoms, particularly associated with overdose, and also the decrease in aggressive behaviour. We know that people are more likely to be aggressive when they are depleted of serotonin, and of course, depressed as well when they're depleted of serotonin, hence um, the serotonin model of depression. It does lead to the release of dopamine and noradrenaline, though far less so than methamphetamine. It has some affinity for the uh, serotonin 1A, 1C and 2A receptor sites as an agonist, though it, given, its, uh, given its minimal affinity and given the release and uh, reuptake inhibition, it's thought that these effects uh, don't really contribute to the subjective effects of MDMA. Importantly, it also leads to the release of the hormone oxytocin, which is essentially the bonding and connecting hormone, which is why people who have taken MDMA uh, in a festival environment feel like they're connected with other people. They um, you know, are, are very uh, open and wanting to disclose information, they feel very close to the people that they're talking to, and we can we can leverage that effect in uh, psychotherapy as well. So, in terms of uh, dosage, I've taken this information from Arrowwood for two reasons. One is it's pretty accurate. Two is that if you don't already know about Arrowwood, it is a fantastic source of information. Um, regarding alcohol and other drugs, not only for clinicians, but also for consumers. So just a shout out to Arrowwood, excellent resource. So in clinical trials, uh, most doses have involved somewhere between 70, 75 and 125 milligrams, which they cite as a common dose for most people. Though you'll note that they have uh, these three different common doses because 
some people seem to be more sensitive or less sensitive to MDMA. And it's for this reason that in clinical trials, it's a fixed dose that's given. Unlike other clinical trials where the dose is based on body weight, in almost all of the clinical trials done on MDMA, it's a fixed dose uh, for this reason. And it's also the rationale for the um, methodology in the phase three trials where they have um, allowed for a flexible dose. So start with a lower dose if the person um, is very sensitive, then they continue with that dose and um, otherwise they move up to a higher dose because they did find that some people were finding 125 milligrams a little bit overwhelming. So in addition to the onset and duration, and of course, there's the after effects, which we commonly refer to in our sector as um, the come down, familiar symptoms of depression, um, sometimes referred to by consumers as Suicide Tuesday. It's thought to be reduced, re related to um, depleted levels of serotonin in the brain. However, what's really interesting is in clinical trials, this hasn't really been observed. And so one hypothesis is that it might be due to um, the function of frequency of use. So people who use MDMA more frequently are more likely to experience these after effects. And I've got some hard data to demonstrate that, albeit um, an N equals four study. So this is from uh, Ben Sessa's uh, preliminary work looking at using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in patients with alcohol use disorder who have comorbid trauma, not PTSD, but trauma with a little t, because as most of us who have worked in the field know, almost all of our clients have experienced some sort of trauma. And so this study was, was looking at the safety and tolerability of MDMA with the aim of then looking at the efficacy of it in terms of its potential treatment in, um, in this particular population. And so some of the data from the N equals four trials. So each of the different colored lines represent a different participant. The Y axis is the, um, the moods scale. Uh, and so the highest score means the negative mood. And what you can see there is there are some big between differences between participants in terms of their mood. However, there's not a significant reduction in mood in the days uh, post MDMA administration. So why PTSD? Well, current treatments are not particularly effective in some individuals. And depending on what literature you read, it could be up to 50% of individuals. Um, the reason being is that our current treatments, the, the gold standard is an exposure paste, CBT or EMDR. It involves people having to, um, to uh, you know, reprocess the trauma through talking about the trauma. And oftentimes people drop out because they become hyper aroused or um, they are not aroused enough through their own um, psychological coping mechanisms that they're employing during the treatment, which means that it isn't effective. So MDMA might provide relief for many of these people who don't, don't respond to the current gold standard treatments that are currently available. And if we can demonstrate efficacy among treatment resistant patients, then it provides a stronger argument for regulating the medical use of MDMA. So the most effective psychological treatments for PTSD, as I said, involve re-exposure to the trauma. And this can be very difficult for patients. Um, I've certainly experienced that in providing um, these treatments to my, my, my patients myself. It's difficult for the clinician, clinician and it's difficult for the client. Um, the emotional re arousal that occurs as a consequence of this re-exposure processing consequence uh, often leads to people dropping out of treatment when they become hyper aroused or um, as I say, they engage in behaviors that prevent them from experiencing enough emotion um, to, for the treatment to be effective. It's a bit like if you're working with somebody with a phobia of spiders, you need to have them aroused enough to habituate to the anxiety of seeing the spider, but not so aroused that they flight and exit the room. Um, 
and you know that's why why flooding is no longer used as a treatment um, for phobias because essentially what we have learned is that we need to work with our patients within something called the window of tolerance it's a bit like the uh the, the goldilocks zone um, and MDMA is an appealing adjunct to such treatments since it not only facilitates trust, which is necessary for such work through the um, oxytocin release, but it also buffers the exposure by inhibiting the subjective fear response to emotional threat through um, its impact on the amygdala. But MDMA not only still allows an individual to experience and process the emotion, because there's plenty of other drugs that inhibit the fear response, such as alcohol and benzodiazepines. People with PTSD uh, may be able, who have never been able to talk about their trauma when intoxicated on uh, benzo, uh, sorry, intoxicated on alcohol, they may be able to talk about their trauma, but they don't reprocess it. And similarly, um, when one of the contraindications to exposure-based treatment is benzodiazepines because uh, it prevents the reprocessing of um, of the trauma. So it, 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 MDMA not only allows the individual to experience and process the trauma, but it allows them to process it in ways that are more accepting. So for example, a person with survivor's guilt comes to accept that they did everything that they could in circumstances and they stop questioning the efforts that they made and what's incredible, having undergone the training for this and seen many videos of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, is the insight that occurs so quickly, um, you know, that would take often weeks of Socratic questioning um, to get a client to have this insight, but they have these insights spontaneously. And one hypothesis is that this is due to the the effect MDMA has on the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with language. So just as an example, um, this is an MDMA therapist who said, once you've used MDMA in psychotherapy, it's like being an artist who's only painted in charcoal and then one day finds oil colors and realizes everything that's available to him or her. It's very powerful when, when you hear about, uh, I mean, having seen it myself, um, it, it's incredible to see the way in which MDMA can work as a catalyst. So before I go into talking too much more about the, the therapy itself, I just wanted to talk about um, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So MAPS has been the driving organization for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy research. Founded in 1986, you'll note the same year, the US banned MDMA. It's a not-for-profit research organization um, that develops medical, legal, and cultural context for people to benefit from the careful use of psychedelics, though so their primary focus is MDMA. Almost all of the clinical research on, on MDMA since it was banned has been sponsored by MAPS. And in 2020 alone, they raised more than $20 million in funding that will be used as part of their plan to make MDMA into an FDA-approved prescription medication. So the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy that's being provided within the MAPS clinical trials over the past 10 years has been informed by a MAPS treatment manual. It draws from psychodynamic, transpersonal, and trauma-focused CBT. And Michael Mithoffer, who developed the, the manual and um, has, I was lucky enough to participate in um, training in which he delivered, also works within an internal family systems um, theory framework. And that made a lot of sense, um, particularly in, in the way he worked. But what he was saying is that this can be adapted to um, different models and that the clinician needs to be most comfortable with the model in which they, they are working within and, and try to see how it would fit within that model. And so it's already been integrated within conjoint CBT therapy um, as an example in Canada. Um, in terms of the psychodynamic uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy respects the interpersonal process Counter-transference and, um, and and transference, 
And so consequently, the protocol involves a male and female co-therapist team to help replicate, uh, particularly for people with um, you know, early childhood sexual abuse, that male-female um, parenting relationship. Sorry, I just got lost a bit there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just, I just wanted to share a very quick story of, of um, one example of that uh, transference reaction. So um, during, during, the, during the training, we uh, watched a video where a female patient under the influence of MDMA uh, perceived that Michael Mithoffer was her father who had sexually abused her and was engaging with her as such. So, um, and Michael was providing a corrective emotional response to that. And I mean, that, that was incredible to watch, but also quite frightening and um, really made me think about um, there's so many people that are, are super keen to get involved in this therapy. And it made me really question, do I really want to, um, uh, you know, carry the risk with using this treatment modality because it can get pretty full on. And that's, I think that's what a lot of the training was trying to demonstrate sort of these are some of the, the um, you know, some of the most um, unexpected or surprising things that happen for, for these therapists. And um, I, think, I think that's an important thing, thing to, to keep in mind when we're talking about regulating MDMA as a medicine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, MDMA allows a person to experience the trauma within an optimum window of arousal, which allows them to habituate to the anxiety whilst also cognitively reprocessing the event, which often, what often takes months of CBT work, in my experience of having watched this and um, not actually provided it myself, but undergone the training, what often takes months of CBT work appears to be able to be achieved in a single MDMA session with those spontaneous insights and an incredible amount of processing and insight that takes place. The psychotherapy itself is non-directive, though it requires the clinician to develop the patient's intention for each drug-assisted session through a lot of preparation work. Clinicians that are accredited by MAPS to provide MDMA psychotherapy are required to complete a three-part training program. And the third part of that program involves the clinician either receiving an MDMA session themselves or participating in, a, in a, an approved um, personal development type um, program that involves some sort of altered state of consciousness. So this is just sort of an outline of the, the structure of MDMA psychotherapy. So it starts with these preparation sessions. Though of course, first is screening. And in the clinical trials at the moment, there are a number of contraindications. So obviously, uh, females who are pregnant or nursing, anybody with a history of a psychotic disorder, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, vascular disorder, people have used ecstasy more than five or 10 times. Um, current use of SSRIs, SNRIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, et cetera, because of the potential for serotonin syndrome. And, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the issues that has emerged in phase three clinical research with MDMA is that it is difficult to take patients off that medication um, prior to them being able to receive MDMA and uh, you know, that there have been one or two incidences where there have been uh, either increased suicidality or a suicide attempt. And so I think that's, again, important to consider when we're thinking about rolling this out as a mainstream treatment is that the, um, is the role that, um, you know, the role of contraindications and, and the role of working with patients who are very unwell and are often taking concomitant medications that they need to be tapered off. After the, uh, the, the preparation session sets them up with the intention for the drug session, which as I mentioned is quite non-directive. The person has eye shades on. I think I've got an example here of um, the room in which the first phase two clinical trial was completed at the myth office place. You can see it's a comfortable environment. Um, there's some music playing in the background therapist on either side of the patient, holding space with the patient and allowing the patient to sort of just go, go inward 
and trusting that their own inner healing intelligence will allow them to, um, to, to, to go where they need to go and bring back the information they bring back. And so people may go, be sort of in their own space with eye shades on listening to music for up to an hour, an hour and a half at a time with minimal intervention. The only time there is intervention is if the, uh, the clinicians suspect that the person might be avoiding or, you know, it's been a long time and they just want to touch in and make sure everything's okay, particularly if they're seeing a lot of emotion welling up in the person, you know, they're, they're um, sobbing um, uh, or, or moving around a lot, they're then um, obviously the, 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 the clinicians check in on how things are going. Um, the drug sessions themselves, uh, I guess I've kind of talked through, uh, then an overnight stay um, in which, uh, they are not discharged until uh, the clinicians are comfortable that they're able to return home safely, ideally in the care of somebody else. And then there's a process of integration with the with the sessions. And so, with the example of the female I provide, uh, the example of the female patient I provided, the integration the next morning was was obviously really important because she was distressed. She recognised, she remembered what happened, and she was extremely. Uh, remorseful and sorry um, that she had behaved this way. And, and again, Michael sort of uh, took a therapeutic approach and said, um, you know, that's what you needed to say at that point in time. And it's my role to be here and, and, and you know, to support that process. Um, so again, looking at the, the corrective emotional response. So some, just some overviews of the data that's been collected to date. Um, this is the first phase two trial method and results. So we've got um, 22 people that were randomized to either uh, MDMA or a placebo control condition. Um, they all had to meet current criteria for PTSD as assessed by the structured clinical interview for DSM and had not responded to at least three months of SSNRI or SSRI treatment for at least six months, or oh, sorry, or at least six months of um, psychotherapy. Uh, these participants complained, completed a range of psychometric tools, including the CAPS, the clinician administered PTSD scale, which was the primary outcome measure. They were then randomly assigned to either 13 sessions of psychotherapy in which they were given 125 milligrams of MDMA, followed by a 65 milligram booster dose two and a half hours later. And this was done on two separate drug assisted sessions. So if we go back to uh, the slide here, it's basically uh, go through that process, rinse and repeat, um, and they did it two times. The current protocol with phase three actually involves three, uh, doing it uh, three drug sessions. So anyway, in this one, they did two drug sessions. Um, three people dropped out in the MDMA arm, one because they were not able to travel to the treatment center, one, because they experienced the relapse of depression and had to be restarted on SSRI, which goes back to my point, uh, and one was deemed not to be treatment resistant. So the data is pretty clear from this flagship study where you can see a significant uh, reduction in PTSD symptoms based on the CAP scores from the MDMA group compared to the placebo group at every point at, of the um, of outcome. So post session one, post session two, and a two month follow-up. At the two month follow-up, 83% of participants no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD after receiving the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And this is significant when you consider that up to 50% of people don't respond to PTSD treatments and these participants were treatment resistant. Only 17 participants who received the psychotherapy alone um, met criteria for PTSD. The interesting part then happens is there's a crossover stage um, where participants who received the placebo, uh, everyone, everything's unblinded. Um, they are then offered the opportunity to participate in an open label um, trial. Seven of eight participants took up this opportunity. Four of these participants, in addition to five of the participants, Five of the participants who were assigned to the MDMA condition at stage one also participated in a third MDMA session, which is sort of the learning from this first study was that three sessions seems to be the optimal amount. 
And the data again speaks for itself, long-term follow-up. Um, people are no longer meeting criteria for PTSD according to the CAPS. So without wanting to be evangelistic, it, it, we, we're talking about people that have are appearing to have been cured of PTSD who are treatment resistant. So there's been six phase two clinical trials completed. And this is just a table that nicely draws the data together from Jerome and you can check that out um, if you're interested and look at it in a bit more detail. But essentially the data was pulled and they found that the long-term follow at long-term follow-up at 12 months, 68 participants in the pooled data no longer met uh, criteria for PTSD. So as a consequence of this, MAPS met with the FDA in November and received approval to commence three multi-site international phase three studies. And because of the large effect size of the, the pooled phase two data, the FDA granted breakthrough designation, which means it's fast tracked. And it also means a smaller sample size is required for, for the phase three trials. And they also provided um, a compassionate access scheme, which is similar to the SASB here in Australia. The first phase three trial has now been completed and the data is being presented to the FDA, possibly as we speak. So that's overseas, what's happening in Australia? Very briefly, uh, psychedelic research in science and medicine was incorporated in 2011. We are a tax exempt health promotion charity with tax deductible gift recipient status. Uh, we're comprised of a board of six directors, uh, four of whom, including myself, are unpaid volunteers. And we have um, a, a, part, a paid part-time executive director and also a secretary role. We have partnerships with MAPS and USONA who are based in the US. Um, USONA is facilitating psilocybin research and the Vazadara Foundation in Australia who have contributed um, to, uh, have made significant contributions to PRISM in terms of operating costs, um, which is sort of outlined there in terms of the, the um, part-time paid roles and also the clinical research um, and assisting us in, uh, in uh, securing further funding. Our plan this year is to become a not a non-profit company limited by guarantee and just sort of finalizing that at the moment. So after forming in 2011, um, Rick Doblin from MAPS was over here. He's very charismatic. He said, you know, you guys can do this research in Australia and we believed him. So we pulled together a um, a, a, a phase two trial based on this, the, the similar protocol that was used um, in the US by MAPS. It was submitted to Bellberry and rejected. Um, then in 2015, a similar protocol was submitted to Deakin University, though it was vetoed by Deakin's Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research prior to it even reaching Deakin's Human Research Ethics Committee. And up until 2017, I had been based in Melbourne working as a clinical trained psychologist, uh, both Peninsula Health and Monash Health. And in 2017, I accepted a full time position here at Edith Cowan University. And given what we learned from the Deakin University experience, once I settled into this new role, I sent my DVCR, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, an email um, providing a bit of background. Um, I knew that he had uh, a background in medicine. So I was hoping that the, the data itself would be appealing. I'm not sure that he knew that MDMA was ecstasy. I attached a few papers and he replied saying, why is this research not happening in Australia? And so ECU has since been very supportive of me leading a small open label trial of MDMA assisted psychotherapy with the support of PRISM and MAPS. We have uh, HREC approval and we're just really working out the state and federal permits to allow us to import, store and administer the MDMA at the moment. But it's certainly the furthest anybody's gotten so far in Australia when it comes to conducting MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Uh, in addition to that, uh, recently announced that Monash is an open, another open label um, trial that's uh, being led by Paul 
Linsky and is also being supported through um, some funding from Dr. Nigel Strauss, who was the psychiatrist involved in the 25, 2015 submission to Deakin that was vetoed. So I have to wonder if, if Deakin, won, uh, you know, in hindsight, whether they still believe they made the right decision in vetoing that, given that um, that Nigel's um, partially self-funding, you know, and putting the money forward to conduct this research now, is very passionate about this research getting up here in Australia. Uh, PRISM itself is also conducting research with psilocybin. We've got mindfulness-based research. We're looking at the potential of neuroscientific research using um, dimethyltryptamine and 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. But the real question is, when will MDMA be available as a Schedule 8 medicine for people to prescribe here in Australia? Now, as I mentioned at the start, the TGA interim decision was hardly a surprise to us. And so, um, you know, having conducted so much research in this space that we published this piece ahead of their announcement in which we predicted some of the reasons the TGA would cite for not changing the scheduling, which included uh, while there is promising evidence emerging, phase three trials have not yet been completed. There's no accredited training program in Australia and only a handful of Australian psychologists and psychiatrists that have been fortunate as, as such as myself have been able to complete the MAPS training program. And we were also concerned about the prohibitive cost because um, if we roll this out in private practice outside of the public health care system. My back of the envelope math said it'd be about $20,000 per patient once you take into account psychiatrist time, two psychologists, uh, the cost of an overnight stay, and the, um, of course, the MDMA itself, which is very expensive at the moment um, to, to access uh, GMP MDMA. So PRISM provided partial support for the TG application, though recommended that an expert advisory uh, panel be, uh, be established in which we develop clinical practice guidelines. Our support was based on the emerging evidence from international research. And so another way of looking at this is, is not a setback, but rather uh, that you know, it's really positive that the TGA has acknowledged the emerging evidence from international research. So I and we at PRISM agree that the applications reschedule um, was made prematurely. And um, however, with appropriate guidelines, sufficient empirical research and clinical governance, both MDMA-assisted psychotherapy could make a considerable contribution to the treatment of PTSD. But we need to have clinical practice guidelines, accredited training programs that are upper endorsed so that we've got a regulation system. It needs to be embedded within the public healthcare system, uh, be that through Medicare or ideally in my dream world uh, where MDMA is covered on the PBS to uh, reduce some of this prohibited prohibitive cost. Um, so the implementation of this framework um, and you know having an independent advisory board to determine the eligibility of licensed clinicians and set dosage standards, labeling, packaging rule requirements. Um, it's it's going to require a bit of legwork, I think, until we're at the point where we can roll this out as a mainstream treatment. Um, even, even now with the phase three trial that has been completed, um, it's not clear whether the FDA will, will allow um, MDMA to be rolled out and um, you know, acknowledged as, as a medical treatment. There may need to be more trials conducted. And as I said, really important for me personally is this issue about equitable access. And, to avoid prohibitive costs, we believe integrate the treatment needs to be integrated into our public health care system. And what's of worthy note is that all of PRISM's current research involves working with public and private hospitals to sort of start mapping out how this might look in the future um, in the public health care system where we believe it belongs. 
and you know, I'm 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 all for private practice as well. Um, though I think, given Australia has an excellent public health care system, um, there's uh, unlike the US, uh, you know, where this this is happening more in the context of um, private psychiatry. This really is um, an opportunity to ensure that the people who need this treatment the most get it and they get it from people who are trained um, and are able to adequately provide that treatment and do no harm. So that's it from me. If you haven't heard of PRISM before, please uh, check out our website. There's plenty of resources on there. And on that note, I'll pass you back to Jim. Thank you, Stephen. I knew I was right asking you to do that presentation, a very excellent and succinct wrap up of history and up to present day. So, you know, much appreciated. Had many questions come in, so thanks for that. My colleague is still busily writing some down, so please keep them going. I'm not sure how many we'll get through, but we'll do our best. Um, one thing popped into my mind just as you were wrapping up and you did actually answer some of the questions in that summary, so thank you. Um, are there any countries currently actually uh, providing this uh, rather than being underground, but I don't know what the opposite of that is, overground? Is it actually taking place anywhere to your knowledge? Well, with the Compassionate Access Scheme in the US, people can access MDMA-assisted psychotherapy outside of the research. Um, and in addition to that, of course, there the phase three clinical trials continue in the US, Israel, Canada. I believe there might be Compassionate Access in uh, Israel as well. I'm not 100% on that. And there's uh, a phase three trial uh, across Europe involving, um, I think, seven or eight different European countries. Yeah, that was my understanding. Thank you. Um, on to the questions that we got from uh, the people tuning in. Are there any studies that show the effect of MDMA used in conjunction with amino acids like tyrosine and tryptophan? So I'm assuming that may be uh, considering restocking of serotonin after use. I'm assuming that that's what that's focused at. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence, um, particularly of uh, people using it recreationally um, both preloading and afterwards, but I'm not aware of any research that's been conducted. Um, I am aware of um, some concerns around the use of 5-HTP um, as it may not cross the blood-brain barrier, but no, no clinical trials that I'm aware of. Sorry. Thank you. No, that's, that's fine. Um, sorry, I've got that many questions. I'm trying to read them as I'm, as I'm trying to talk. Has there been any work around MDMA use, to your knowledge, with clients that actually are uh, experiencing mental health issues such as schizophrenia or psychosis? I know that tends to be an exclusion uh, for therapy. Yeah, they have been excluded from therapy at the moment, and I would expect that if this is rolled out um, as a you know as a, a Schedule Eight medicine or, or a Schedule Two medicine in the US, that those there would be those same contraindications. Yeah, I think I think it's too early to look look towards those sort of things at the moment. Um, also, you mentioned a lot of the uh, negative effects associated weren't evident in the uh, therapy sessions. Does that include the common ones that we associated with we associate with MDMA use, such as hypothermia and hyponatremia? No, actually, no, because a lot of the hyponatremia comes from either people consuming too much um, liquid. Uh, and, uh, you know, dehydration occurred, occurring with exercise. So within the protocol, um, the participants are limited to how much Gatorade they're allowed to drink over the course of the day. Uh, there is some, um, um, you know, their body temperature does increase, um, blood pressure increases, but not beyond that with which you would expect to see um, somebody engaged in um, physical activity. And so, um, in the first studies, blood pressure monitoring was happening very frequently and it was almost disruptive to the therapeutic process, whereas now there's only one or two readings that take place and it's up to the physician that's overseeing the, uh, the research to make a call on that, particularly whether or not the person um, should receive a second dose and also whether there needs to be any intervention to reduce their blood pressure. To my knowledge, there has been, um, I think there has been one patient where their blood pressure 
was quite concerning, but no intervention was was provided. And that was the clinical decision that was made by that clinician overseeing the, the medical monitoring and there were no reported adverse um, effects. And I think that also comes down to the importance of that knowing your dose and the set and setting when anyone's using a substance, which is obviously highly controlled as it should be in those in those uh, scenarios. Um, <coughs> With uh, medicinal cannabis obviously being used in Australia, um, we know that many people will access a medicinal prescription, but will also uh, supplement their uh, supply on the illicit market. Somebody's asked, do you think that that's an issue that might occur with prescription NDMA and will people then supplement on top of? Well, I think one of the big differences with MDMA and what's going to be a selling point to the TGA, the FDA, these regu regulatory authorities is that nobody gets a takeaway, take home dose. You only have the dose in the hospital with psychiatrists and psychologists present. So um, there isn't the risk of that. They're, people are screened beforehand, so they have to do a urinalysis beforehand to ensure that they don't have anything in their system that could potentially interact with MDMA. Um, and I'm aware of at least, at least one, but maybe no more than one case, where a person engaged in a clinical trial uh, took MDMA uh, recreationally afterwards because they wanted to uh, replicate that experience. They actually said that it, um, it, because the set and setting wasn't there, it wasn't what they had anticipated and they did not plan on doing it again. Yeah, and I guess they also couldn't even guarantee that they were taking MDMA because of the way that they accessed the, the medication, and I use that word loosely. Um, Interesting question. So uh, for those that have taken MDMA, there's definitely an effect when you hit that effect window. So when it came to uh, looking at the studies and the placebo, um, did they have an active placebo and did the people know that they were using a placebo and how do you think that might have come across in the results? So this is a really interesting point. Um, they have tried a low dose of MDMA as an active placebo um, to, to help with the blinding. Um, they actually found that some of the low doses actually made people worse um, rather than better. So it was worse than uh, giving them nothing. Giving a low dose was worse than nothing. Um, what's really interesting is with the, with the double blind, there were a number of occasions where uh, both the therapist and the clinician um, guessed wrong in terms of which condition they had been placed in. And in fact, a couple of patients, um, you know, when you look at the overall data or the pool data, there are, there are patients that have recovered um, that didn't receive MDMA. They just received the placebo. It is, it's really hard to, um, you know, do a double blind controlled trial with, with MDMA and even harder with something like psilocybin. And what the FDA have said to MAPS in developing their drug um, you know, in, in terms of their drug development program and, and forging forward with um, these phase three trials is that they shouldn't have to take any different approach than any other um, drug development. There's no other, um, you know, pharmaceutical company developing drugs where they're providing an active placebo. So th there's kind of been some rest assurance from the FDA on that. Um, yeah. be interesting to see what the TGA think of that. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, very valid question followed. Is there, uh, to your knowledge, any use for it outside of PTSD? Um, so somebody's put end of life anxiety in palliative care and somebody else uh, wrote an interesting one, which was any use in dementia or anything like that. I'm not aware of, of use in dementia. That has a question has come up about that before. And I think there, it might be to do with um, MDMA and, and Parkinson's disease and related dementia. I'm not actually across that, to be honest. Um, in terms of other conditions, uh, it has been used in the past to treat end of life anxiety and um, you know, in, 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 in a research context. And also um, what's really interesting is uh, the treatment of social anxiety among adults with autistic spectrum disorder. That's interesting, yeah. Mm. 
Um, somebody's written, I read somewhere that veterans, and apologies, these ones have just been handed, so I'm just reading as they come. I read somewhere that veterans, ex-military police personnel struggled more with trust in the studies and therefore the effect was less effective. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, look, I, I, I think there was variation both within the groups and across the groups. And so, yes, there, there, there might have been some that had a particular difficulty with, with um with even um, just sort of letting go and going into the experience because they, you know, that, that's, you know, that their job has to be in, be in control and be alert and hyper aroused. Um, though I think um, I, I've certainly seen cases of, of ex-military that uh, responded very well to it. So, yeah, I think there's probably a lot of within group as well as between group differences there in terms of people being able to um, to engage in the therapy. And I think some of this comes out when you look at the difference between that flagship study data that I presented, where we're talking about 83% versus the um, uh, the pool data, which was was closer to 68%. Yeah, and I think also that uh, raises the importance of those sessions prior to the administration of the MDMA, because I think we all, whether we're aware of it consciously or not, we all carry some of that anxiety around what we've heard over the last 50 years about these substances, and so there's going to be concern about actually taking them and are they safe, etc. Um, and I think we carry a lot of that with us into those experiences, potentially. Um, somebody's asked, do clients, have clients ever had a really bad time or a bad trip in the uh, process of therapy? I, I would frame it the other way. I don't think I've ever seen anyone having a great time on it. Um, yeah, there, was one, there was one participant um, who they allowed, they, they knew he uh, didn't need a third session, um, but they allowed him to have the third session anyway, and he actually, <laughs> he did enjoy it. He listened to some music he wanted to listen to, um, and it was really nice that uh, that they allowed that to happen and for him to just, you know, celebrate how far he's come. But most of the people I've seen uh, engaged in this therapy are not having fun at all. They are, uh, they, they, it, it, it is a couple of things, I, I'll just two, I guess two quick things. I mean, I went into the training thinking, um, you know, that I'd pick the right straw, the long straw in terms of the two trials that we were looking at getting up in Australia at the time, because psilocybin can be so unpredictable. Um, you don't know where the person's going to go. They can have any intention they want and you just can't predict where that's going to go. Um, but however, once I got to the training and saw uh, just how interactive it was during the MDMA session. You know, in the psilocybin sessions, it's a lot quieter. People, you're just holding space with the person. Um, people were, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of um, somatic therapy, um, stuff that myself and my therapists aren't necessarily comfortable doing in our clinical trial, so body work, um, but things that we would be comfortable doing as well, like allowing people to, um, you know, punch a pillow or th there needs to be this displacement of energy. I think um, the trauma becomes activated again and the fight flight instinct is activated and they need to really get that energy out um, of their body rather than what happened in the trauma, which is where they, they, they froze. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like I, in the end, I may have drawn the short straw on this one um, in terms of, um, yeah, the, 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 the way in which uh, MDMA affects people. And also, I, you know, I'd come in looking after people in a harm reduction, you know, harm reduction services at festivals. Most people that I was looking after had taken um, LSD or something similar. Not too many people with just MDMA on its own unless they've taken too much. And then it's usually paramedics involved. You know, most people that I saw at a festival at MDMA were having a great time um, hugging each other. And I thought this will be fun. Um, yeah. No, it's not. The, 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 the setting that's provided, the preparation, the set and setting, it creates a completely different environment and the focus on the trauma. Um, it just makes me want to get that message across that, I think a lot of clinicians, particularly with the media that's uh, you know been coming out around uh, the lead up to the TGA decision, and now the TGA decision and the, and the media that's occurring at the moment, you know, a lot of clinicians are really keen to put their hand up and get involved. And I just say, 
maybe just take a step back and um, try to try to get some sense of 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 um, what the therapy involves because it is bloody full on. And yeah. even the the, ther- the training itself, we we did sessions that lasted up to fifteen hours because the MDMA session could last eight, 10, 12 hours, depending on the person. And they said, if you can't sit here for a 15 hour session training, um, maybe this is the wrong therapy for you. I think that's highly valid. Like you, I've had lots of people wanting to move into this space. And, you know, they see the results from maps, which obviously are outstanding um, and properly exciting. But yeah, I think they forget that people are going through an incredibly difficult time and rather than just an hour psychology session which might be the normal it can be many many hours and extremely draining for both parties i think that's a valid point thank you for that um somebody's asked do we have contact details for my medicine australia i'll get my colleague to just google that and put the link in the chat box i'd also encourage you to have a look at their youtube channel because they've got a lot of webinars on there somebody else has asked is there a risk of dependence in terms of a client becoming dependent on MDMA. Um, and I know that MAPS have protocols about spacing of MDMA sessions and that. So I'd let you talk about that, Stephen. Well, I just, I just talk about my own clinical experience. You don't come across too many um, clients that are presenting with MDMA dependence. And the reason for that is that um, if you take MDMA on, uh, you know, if you take it too frequently, you end up getting lots of the negative effects and much less of the positive effects. And yeah. so while you might see the odd young person who is psychologically dependent on MDMA, there's no potential for physiological dependence. And I think, um, you know, doing this in the context of clinical um, work is, is very different to um, that which leads to that psychological dependence you might see in the clients we work with. Sure. Now, you mentioned about the cost of, you know, obviously anything that's going to you know, potentially be a cure for PTSD is obviously fabulous and is, you know, in long term scale is going to be cost effective. But as you rightly said, the actual short term cost can be is likely to be fairly prohibitive just for many people, depending on how it works with PBS and that. Um, what about the actual cost and manufacture of the drug itself? Do you see that as being, because um, obviously there's lots of companies trying to patent different aspects of drugs so that they can charge. How do you see that panning out? Well, I know that the the MDMA that we get that we're using is coming from Maps. Um, I'm not aware of any other supplier of um, GCMP MDMA at this stage, and it costs Maps a lot of money to um, produce the the batch that they're using. Um, in the phase two trials, they actually used an earlier batch, um, which I was hoping we were going to use here in Australia as well. It was uh, synthesized by um, a very well known psychopharmacologist, uh, Dave, Professor David Nichols, um, just before MDMA was banned, he synthesized one kilo for Rick. It's been kept in a safe in storage. It's still 99.9% .9 pure last time it was tested. Um, but for phase three research, it has to be GCMP and that costs a lot more. It's like in the medical cannabis space, um, you know, to be able to produce uh, medicinal cannabis products that meet the Australian requirements in terms of GCMP, um, is, is, has often limited um, even Australian manufacturers in supplying the Australian market. And a lot of the, the, the stuff they're producing is being sold overseas because we have such stringent standards here in Australia. So I do foresee that as being an ongoing, an ongoing issue. However, you know, it, it is off patent. So people could potentially uh, manufacture it and with down scheduling, um, there would be less regulation around that. So I think over time, um, yeah. the, the drug itself will become cheaper. And uh, ideally, in my ideal world, where it's covered by the PBS, um, it's not really an issue anyway. Sure. Let's, let's hope one day that's in the not too distant future. I know initially MAPS were hoping for 2021, um, then COVID kicked in and I think they suggested the delay will now be till 2023. But let, let's hope that is the start of things rolling out and, you know, if efficacy being uh, reproduced and, you know, uh, countries taking it on board and then, you know, costs will obviously come down. 